Since the beginning of time, there have been many conspiracies running around our planet. And as we walk into the dawn of a new day and the veil is lifting from our eyes, we now understand that some of these French ideas aren't so French. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers. Truly, honestly, I could not do this channel without you guys. All the monthly donations that you make go to supporting the workings of this channel. That means that with our patrons, we can get lights when we have a light burnout. I can purchase material if I need it for deeper research. And as I've mentioned before, we're taking a percentage of the Patreon money each month to put aside so that we can purchase a heavy duty computer that's able to edit really quickly and really fast so that we can get even more content out to you. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today on Mystery Monday, we're going to be talking about the very mysterious passing of Brittany Murphy. Now, I was going to film this story as a bonus episode. I know we're right in the middle of our New Orleans breakdown and series. However, as of late, I've had so many guests on the show that I felt like this episode would be better for a Monday mystery. Although, in my opinion, it's not really a mystery because I think, like most of you think, we probably know the truth of this situation, if not all the details. We definitely know that what they told us happened probably didn't happen. Now, when I film my videos, I do not script myself. I have here a notebook that's full of like notes that I go through and I pause and I look at just to make sure I'm following the timeline or the storyboard that I want to tell you guys the story. I'm way better at ab-libbing than I am following a script. So with that being said, I'm not exactly sure right now while I'm filming this video if when this video airs there will be a comment section or not. It depends on what happens or how it reads during the editing process. Now I do try to render all of my videos to YouTube about a week in advance just to see if anything catches in YouTube's system before it's released to the public so I can go back and try to fix things if I need to. Again, this is a very interesting time that we're living in. And there are only a few of us that are actually left on this platform. And I know I spoke to Janine about this off camera one day about how we are kind of unintentionally the gateway for a lot of people who are very new to our community to then find our friends who are now on other platforms. For example, before The Great Awakening, I only knew about this platform. I had no idea that there was a bit shoot or a rumble or whatever. I only knew about YouTube. And it wasn't until everything started happening that the dominoes started following and a lot of our friends were forced to leave this platform that I even found out about these other platforms. And so with those of us who are left here, we want to be able to help other people, new people who are just now starting to wake up, we want to be able to stay on this platform so we can help usher them to other people, if that makes sense. So with that being said, we have to be super, super, super careful about how we present our work. I know that you guys understand this. This is not our rules. This is YouTube's house, YouTube's rules. So we have to try really hard to stay within those boundaries. Now with most social media, it runs off of algorithms. And we know that because this is such a huge platform that it is a machine that's reading things. And so when certain triggers come up, it will then go back and examine a particular content creator. 
And so with more potent videos or especially potent guests, powerful guests, guests that we want people to see, those types of guests, when we have them on our channel, sometimes it is in the best interest that we do then disable the comments so that there isn't, basically isn't a heavy algorithm associated with that particular story, if that makes sense. Normally when that happens with guests, I then will put a comment on the community board so that you guys can ask your questions there so it's separated from the video. With this video though, I will wait and see at the end of the video as I'm editing what it looks like and if by chance it does feel like it's pretty potent as we like to say, I will then disable the comments and I will leave a place on the community board for you to ask questions and make your comments. So again, it is separate from the video as we try to like mwahahaha fool the robot that is that is observing this whole channel. These are definitely crazy times we're living through. It's not right, it's not fair, and it's not something any of us like, but I do believe that this will pass very, very soon. And on that note, sometimes when I need like a mental break from the heaviness of everything we research, I will go and watch like the drama channels. I mean, I do love my reality TV show, I'm not gonna lie. I love the Jersey Housewives and the Beverly Hills Housewives and you know, all that kind of stuff. That's kind of my junk food for my brain. But when I go over to these drama channels, I have noticed that they are starting to experience the same type of issues that we in this community have been experiencing for a very long time. That's how strict it's gotten with certain words. I mean, literally words that you would never think would have to be bleeped out now have to be bleeped out. And it's not just us that are experiencing this now, but it's the basic drama channels too. But I know most of you guys absolutely understand where we're coming from. As I said in my community post a while ago, you are all a part of this as well. Even if you don't have a channel, that's okay. We are all in this together. You are, you are me, I am you. We are all standing united together. So I know that you guys understand what we're saying. And we just gotta make it to the finish line. All right, so let's get into Brittany Murphy. Most of you have probably already heard of this case. A lot of people in our community have been kind of scratching their heads at this case because what they told us happened to her doesn't seem to be the truth. And there are a lot of very, very strange and weird situations surrounding her passing. Now I'm going to try to, to watch myself and not say the D word because that is one of the, the censored words, oddly, is the D word. So I'm going to try to just say passing throughout this video, but you guys know what I mean. As our friend Janine says, leaving the earth plane. Janine is really, really good, by the way. She's really talented at figuring out how to say something without actually saying it. She's super good at that. Brittany Murphy was born on the 10th of November, 1977 in Atlanta, Georgia, in my hometown, where I'm filming from right now. Her mother was Sharon Kathleen Murphy, and her father was Angelo Joseph Bertolotti. Now her father's a very interesting man and he's not really going to come into play until later on in our story. Actually, he is one of the warriors for truth. When Brittany was two years old, her parents did divorce. There were rumors that her father was involved in like organized crime and spent some time in jail. I haven't really looked into that side of the story too much because I'm more concerned about Brittany, but that's super interesting. And honestly, these groups, y'all know what I'm talking about, starts with an M, that her father may or may not have been involved with, in my opinion, at this point in, in, in our journey, seem way less nefarious than the other groups that we're going to talk about. I think you guys know what I'm saying. So after they divorced when Brittany was two, Brittany and her mother moved to Edison, New Jersey. In 1982, at a very young age, Brittany was enrolled at the Vimey Fowler School of Dance and Theater Arts that is located in New Jersey, meaning that from the ages of 4 to 13, she was trained as an actress. In 1991, right before Brittany was to enroll in high school, her mother and her moved out to Los Angeles, California, so she could pursue a career in the movies. Now, Brittany and her mother had a very interesting relationship. I know that 
for most of Britney's life, it was just her and her mom. Some people could say that is why they were so close, but other people think that there was more of a nefarious something something going on here. I, I don't know at this point. I don't trust Sharon. That's just my opinion. I don't trust her, which we'll get into that later on, but I don't know if that's just because she's just a weird egg or if she's involved somehow in what eventually happened to Brittany. Brittany would go on to pick up little roles here and there, some commercials, little extra stuff, small supporting roles, but in 1995, she had her big break in the movie Clueless. I know most of you guys are very familiar with the movie Clueless. It ended up becoming a very classic movie that many generations have enjoyed. Now, when Brittany was cast in Clueless, she was kind of cast as the character of the Ugly Duckling, so to speak. She was cast with Alicia Silverstone and Stacey Dash, two very, very beautiful actresses who already had a name and some fame behind them. Now, needless to say, Brittany Murphy did kind of steal the show with her performance. And even though she was kind of cast as like the ugly duckly character, in my opinion, she was always beautiful. And it wasn't like she was super overweight. She was a normal, healthy sized girl. But in the 90s, in Hollywood at that point, people believed that this, this whole role of, of playing this particular character psychologically started to wear on Brittany. Because it was after playing Ty in Clueless that Brittany Murphy dropped a whole lot of weight and dyed her hair blonde. Again, I think she was absolutely gorgeous. But rumors did kind of spread that maybe she had dabbled in drugs or something and that's why she lost the weight so quickly. I don't really know much about that, nor do I care. I did live in Los Angeles for a really long time and the pressure to be thin there is unbelievable. So it's not like you have to be doing something to lose the weight. Sometimes it's literally just the environment that you're in. Brittany Murphy also worked in other roles, such as voicing Luann Platter on King of the Hill. She also did an incredible job with Angelina Jolie. That was Angelina jo Jolie's breakout role in Girl Interrupted. She voiced Gloria Penguin in the animated film Happy Feet. She also was in the movie Eight Mile with Eminem, where she had a bit of a relationship with Eminem and also was in the movie Just Married with Ashton Kutcher. And of course, she ended up dating Ashton Kutcher for a little while. In fact, she kind of had a habit of dating her co-stars, which is common in Hollywood. I, you know, and she was also young, like young and in her 20s, like that's just what you do. Although for her being a celebrity, her life is being photographed all the time. But honestly, if you think back to your 20s, that's not something that's super weird. She ended up dating her talent manager as well. And then she was engaged to a production assistant named Joe Macaluso. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she ended up married to a man named Simon Monjack. Now, I don't want to offend anybody with what I'm about to say, and I, and I hope I can say this well, but this is a very peculiar relationship. They don't even look like they go together, if that makes sense. And, and, and relationships aren't based off of looks. No, they're not. In fact, the older you get, the more you realize that. But there was just something very strange about this relationship. For starters, how they met always seemed to be be a bit of a mystery. Some people believe that they actually knew each other as children. Like it had been a long time friendship or acquaintanceship. Other people claim that they met at a party in 2006, a Hollywood party. Simon was seven years older than Brittany. He already, I believe, had had a marriage before Brittany. He was from Buckinghamshire, England. Now, interestingly enough, Simon's mother allegedly is a hypnotherapist. Now, I, I know she's still alive, so I don't want to say anything that's inaccurate, but that was kind of a red flag to me, this idea of hypnotherapy, because we know that there's a lot of, of mind control going on in, in these environments. It could be harmless, though. She honestly could just be a hypnotherapist, just a basic everyday hypnotherapist, nothing nefarious. But again, that was kind of a red flag, something very, very odd. 
It is stated by many articles that Simon was a, of average intelligence and he had a propensity of not really finishing his work, aka in my opinion, that reads as being a little lazy. And if you look at him, it doesn't surprise me that he seems like he's someone who's a little bit lazy. Now he claims that he, or he claimed, because he is no longer with us as well, which we'll get to, that he was a screenwriter. And in fact, his name does appear on the 2005 credit reel of Factory Girl. But how his name ended up on the credit reel of Factory Girl is pretty dubious too. It's like he, from what I understand, he claimed that they had stolen his script or something and he tried to take him to court and so they finally just like put his name on the credits. It seemed to me just how I was reading it that they just thought, oh, we'll just put his name on the credits. It's easier than actually going to court and fighting this so we'll just give the guy this credit and move on. Now Simon himself allegedly was not that great with money. According to some of the articles that I read, he owed a large debt back in the United Kingdom to the Royal Bank of Scotland group. Brittany and Simon got married in a private Jewish ceremony in 2007. It was a very, very hasty and quick engagement in marriage. According to what I've read, Simon was a month over the expiration date of his travel visa into the United States. So a lot of people speculate that their quick marriage was to get him a green card so that he would not be deported back to the United Kingdom. I can believe this and I can see an act like this not necessarily being ill will or being nefarious. If you truly, truly love someone and you're probably going to get married anyway, why not just go ahead and get married, especially if you're on two different passports. It just makes things a lot easier. However, these are in situations where their meeting is not dubious but understandable, but with Simon and Brittany, the whole inception of their relationship is just super, super strange. Allegedly, Brittany was a pretty outgoing girl, had a lot of friends from what I read, but the minute she started dating and then married Simon, she became more closed off, more introverted, didn't leave the house that much. Now, Brittany and Simon bought a home in the Hollywood Hills. This house happened to have been owned by Britney Spears and her then boyfriend, Justin Timberlake. And the house is super, super interesting. There's something very, very, very dark about this house. Britney Spears herself claimed the house was haunted. She claimed at times that she didn't want to go back into the home, which is a claim that Brittany Murphy would make right before her passing. Now, we know that there's all sorts of very, very horrible things going on in the Hollywood Hills where this house was located. We know about underground tunnels, a lot of people practicing the dark arts. This is not really conspiracy at this time. We actually know that this is fact. And so I can't help but speculate that there was something with the house that had to do with a particular you know, dark group that tends to run within Hollywood as well as our alleged government. The house now that Britney Murphy and Britney Spears lived in is no longer standing. Soon after the passings, her mother sold the house and they completely demolished it and built a new house. So if, if you're in that area, you're not going to see the same structure that Britney Murphy or Britney Spears lived in. Doesn't change the fact that there might be underground passages, but it does still change the way we're viewing the home. Now, right before Britney passed, her career had been on the decline. In my opinion, Britney was a really good actress. I loved all the work she did. She had perfect comedic timing. She also was really good with drama. And again, before she met Simon, it does seem like she got along pretty well with people in her industry. It was only after she met Simon and married her that her relationship with other colleagues seemed to go a little bit south. In fact, after the movie Little Black Book, she had a really hard time booking work. And as I said, before her passing, just like her predecessor, Britney Spears, 
Brittany Murphy did not want to go back to this particular house. There were stories listed in The Hollywood Reporter that Brittany Murphy would beg her husband to let them just go stay in a hotel for a while. She just did not like this house. This house creeped her out. I don't blame her. The house that I grew up in really creeped me out too. Like I even as a teenager hated being alone in that house. There was something very dark in that house and I'm really really glad that my mother does not own that house anymore and lives in another house now because there was something really sinister in that house. I still don't know what it is, but I just, even as a kid, did not like that house. So yeah, I mean, places can be haunted. They can be like marked with some bad energy, bad juju. And of course, if there is some, you know, clockwork orange type mind control stuff going on in the neighborhood and perhaps underneath, it can cause a visceral reaction from a person, even if the person can't quite remember has had their mind scrambled regarding that particular house. I'm just alleging this happened. I don't know if it happened or not, but it just kind of seems like there was a definite reaction to this house in the same way Britney Spears had, and we all know what's going on with her too. Anyway, I think you guys know what I'm saying. Now it is rumored that Brittany Murphy really wanted to be a mother. She wanted to have children. And so around the time where her career is kind of on the decline and, and she doesn't like their house, she was speaking to Simon and her mother because her mother very weirdly lived with them as well about moving to New York and starting over. She felt like at this point, Simon could then really focus on his writing career and she could focus on having children and being a mom, which seems fair because at this point, both Simon and her mother, Sharon, were basically living off of Brittany Murphy. Brittany Murphy was the sole provider for her family and this necessarily is not a bad thing. In a lot of families, there's one person who is the breadwinner but it really does seem like they were just pulling, pulling, pulling from her. She was nothing, in my opinion, but a cash cow. Now, the fact that Sharon lived with her daughter and her son-in-law isn't what's weird. There are a lot of in-laws that will live with their children, and especially since Sharon herself had been diagnosed with breast cancer in 2004, there is a lot of understanding as to why she was living with her daughter. But there was like a possessiveness, a weird possessiveness between both Simon and Sharon. And if you look at pictures of Brittany before she passed, you can definitely see like in her eyes and her face that it was almost like her life force was just being sucked out of her. But Simon and Sharon's story will get even weirder, trust me. On December 20th, 2009, at 8 o'clock in the morning, the Los Angeles Fire Department received a call requesting that they visit the home of Brittany Murphy. According to what I could find, Brittany Murphy woke up at 7.30 in the morning complaining of severe stomach pains. She went into her bathroom where she proceeded to pass out. At that point, Simon and her mother allegedly tried to put her in the shower to wake her up. Now, I want to mention that at this point, Brittany was only 32 years old, a very, very young, healthy, vibrant girl. I also want to mention that in this crazy, weird, dark house, the bathroom, according to Simon, was Brittany's happy place. Like, that's where she would go to find peace and to separate herself from the chaos of Hollywood or whatever type of Hollywood life she was being forced to live. And so it's quite ironic that this would be the last place she would be in her life. There is a 911 call that you can Google and listen to between Sharon and the 911 operator regarding trying to resuscitate Brittany. I'm not going to play it on this channel because, again, I don't want to have eyes on me as far as copyright information just because of the nature of our channel here. But if you do want to listen to that, it is available out there. You can hear Sharon kind of panic and then she gets calm again and then she panics again. I'm not really going to comment on that. Some people thought it was kind of strange that all of a sudden she got peaceful. I don't really know about that. In fairness, even though I think that there's something very strange going on with Sharon, and I don't really trust her. People act very weird when they're faced with stressful situations. So I'm not going to really comment on the 911 call because that could have very logically just been a stress response of kind of panicking and then kind of going 
into like a peaceful place, like in shock and then panicking again. If there are any psychiatrists watching or therapists watching, I'm sure you can comment on that because you just never know how people are going to actually react when something as traumatic as potentially losing your child happens to you. But needless to say, Brittany Murphy was rushed to Cedar sinai Medical Center where they tried to resuscitate her, but unfortunately at 10.04 a.m. on the 20th of December 2009, Brittany Murphy was pronounced now, immediately, they wanted to do an autopsy, which her husband, Simon, tried to postpone. He did not want them doing an autopsy. However, Simon's request was overruled by the coroner, and different states do have different laws in the United States regarding an autopsy. For a lot of states, it's just a natural process, especially since the person who has passed away maybe have passed away unexpectedly, like they weren't super sick or didn't have cancer, there was not, you know, or they weren't super old, like it's kind of common practice for a lot of states to then just do an autopsy just so they can see what actually happened to cause a 32 year old woman to Ed Winter, who was the assistant chief coroner, told the Associated Press that her death did, however, seem to be natural after the autopsy was performed. On December 24th, 2009, Christmas Eve, Brittany was interned at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in the Hollywood Hills. If we look at the autopsy report that was done on the 21st of December, the day after her passing, we have notes of an event that happened six weeks before she passed away. This was their trip to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Brittany Murphy had landed a job. She was going to be starring in the low budget film called The Collar. Now, oddly enough, Brittany only worked on the collar for one day before she no longer was associated with the project. The alleged rumor was that Simon, her husband, came onto the set drunk and was causing a lot of chaos. The people working on the movie asked Simon to leave, and when he refused to leave, Brittany stood up for him instead of her job, and therefore she was basically fired from this movie. Now this is interesting because there are rumors that he would do this anyway. As I said, when she married Simon, things seemed to change. It was almost like he was extremely possessive of her, very jealous of her. Her mother also, allegedly, in my opinion, seemed to also be very possessive and jealous of things happening around her own daughter. Again, in my own opinion, not fact, but in my opinion. Now, the story goes that after Brittany left this project, her, her husband, and her mother, because yes, her mother traveled with her and her husband down for her to do her job in Puerto Rico, decided just to stay in Puerto Rico for 10 days for a little vacation. While in Puerto Rico, both Sharon and Simon got sick. It happens when you travel to a foreign country, sometimes you can get, you know, a little bit of sickness from the water or from whatever, just being in a different environment. Happens to me literally all the time. Every time I travel to India, I always get sick. It's normal. However, Brittany did not get sick. But when they returned home from the trip, Brittany then got sick. So at this point, the coroner believed that what happened to Simon and Sharon must have been a virus, and Brittany must have been affected by this virus once they were back in Los Angeles. On her death certificate, it is written that she passed away from really pneumonia mixed with anemia, mixed with a cocktail of 10 different prescription drugs. This was officially added on February 4th of 2010. That just happened to be my 27th birthday. Now the coroner did mention that all these prescription pills in her system weren't dubious. It wasn't like they were drugs of entertainment or party drugs. They were literally drugs that were supposed to be for fighting off like a respiratory infection. And so it occurred to the coroner that even though she was taking pre prescription drugs that weren't all hers, that she was just trying to like 
cure whatever sickness she had contracted from her mom and husband down in Puerto Rico. Nothing super suspicious. We've all done that. We've all taken something, even if it's not ours, that's our parents, our spouses, or our siblings, that is for a particular, like an antibiotic, that's like for a particular virus. Nothing fun happens with this. It's literally just a medication to get healthy. And so that's kind of what they said it happened. Like she had this pneumonia, she was taking all these concoctions trying to heal herself. And on top of that, she also had anemia. Now, this is strange to me because again, I'm not a doctor. I come from a bunch of doctors, families in the medical industry, but I am not a doctor. Now, anemia isn't something that's rare. I'm a little anemic. My sister's a little anemic. Probably most of you watching are a little anemic. This is not, again, a very rare disorder or a disorder that really causes that much of a health issue if you're aware of it and you know how to work with it to help your body get the iron that it needs. Now the doctor's excuse for putting pneumonia and anemia on the death certificate was that because of the anemia that was so strong and all the drugs, her body just could not fight it off and that's what caused her to kind of go into a cardiac arrest and pass away. All in all, that seems pretty logical. It's just like this perfect storm of bad luck and strange occurrences. On the 23rd of May, 2010, her husband, Simon Monjack, also passed away in the same bathroom under the same circumstances. Now there had been some weird occurrences with both Simon and Sharon right after Brittany again had passed away. They both continued to live in the house. And when the emergency responders came to the house when Simon himself passed, it appeared that Sharon, Brittany's mother, had been staying in the same bed as her son-in-law, Simon. Y'all, that's so freaking creepy. I could not imagine my mother staying in the same bed with Todd, my boyfriend. That's freaking weird. There was also a rumor that was going around, and I couldn't find any um, proof behind this rumor, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Just know it was just a rumor that allegedly on the side of the bed where Sharon was sleeping, they found some prescription drugs that said Sharon Monjack. That's Simon's last name, as in her late daughter's husband's last name. It is also alleged that right before he passed away, he called his mother over in England and was telling her he did not feel well and he had a fever of 104 and needs to be seen by Dr. ASAP. It is said that her mother begged Sharon to take her son to the doctor, but Sharon wouldn't do it. We also know that on the date that Britney's death certificate was released, again, my 27th birthday, February 4th, 2010, Simon and Sharon launched the Britney Murphy Foundation. This was supposed to kind of be a catch-all foundation from what I could find where it helped kids in low economic areas be involved in the arts. There was also like a branch of it for like cancer survivors like Sharon. Anyway, they had this huge event, event on February 4th, 2010, where they took in all these donations. However, there was never any filings for their 501c3. There was never any tax paperwork for this foundation, even though they were taking in lots and lots of money and donations, which is super suspicious to me because, as I said, Brittany was kind of their cash cow, and now that she's gone, it's almost like they're still creating this, this entity that would represent Britney to also be like a cash cow for them. But regardless of the fact, in 2018, the foundation was completely defunct. Now, as I said, Simon's death certificate said the same thing as his wife's death certificate that he died of pneumonia and anemia. And this whole rumor of toxic mold started to swirl about. Toxic mold could explain everything. It could explain crazy hallucinations that people like Britney Spears had allegedly had in the house and Britney Murphy. It could explain the paranoia, the reason why she was withdrawing. Mold can really, really hurt someone. And it could explain why a healthy 32-year-old girl would eventually pass away. The body can only fight so hard. However, Simon Monjack was older than her and was a quite, quite a bit heavier than her. So if that was the case, it's kind of shocking that she went first and not him. Deductive reasoning on my part as a layman, like that just seems like he would have a harder time fighting it than she was because he was not, she, 
because in my opinion, she appeared to be healthier than he did. It's also strange because nothing ever happened to Sharon. If there was toxic mold in the house, Sharon most likely would have also been affected by the mold. Now, the coroner did say that this was not the case. Like, he didn't see any signs of toxic mold in Brittany's autopsy or in Simon's autopsy. And at first, Sharon seemed to, like, agree with the coroner that, no, this, this house is fine. But now that Sharon is living alone in this mansion in the Hollywood Hills, she decides to file a lawsuit against the builders of the house for said toxic mold, even though no toxic mold was found. Eventually, Sharon would go on to sell the house as I said or earlier, and the house was completely demolished and rebuilt. If this story isn't weird enough, it now is about to get weirder because on January 11th, 2012, Brittany's father, who had been a little bit absent in her life, all of a sudden comes back and demands before the Superior Court of California to have some of his daughter's hair tested. It seems that Angelo, her dad, wasn't buying this story. Angelo was convinced that something dark and sinister had happened to his daughter and his son-in-law. Although it appears he was more concerned about his daughter as he basically just spoke about her. He claimed that a lot of the forensic evidence had been hidden by Los Angeles County, evidence that would have proven that Brittany's passing wasn't natural, but was. By July 19th of 2012, the court, the Los Angeles County Court, dismissed his request to have Brittany's hair tested. Of course they did. In my opinion, the Los Angeles County Court System, along with most all the court systems in our country and in all the countries around the world, are part of the problem and part of this dark group of individuals that practice a very, very dark religion that we see both in Hollywood and in our government system. Allegedly, y'all know what I'm talking about. I can't say the word out loud, but it starts with an I. It ends with a T.I. But like any good parent, this dismissal from the court did not stop Angelo. He allegedly had two different independent tests done on some of Britney's hair. And basically both of the reports, again, allegedly came back that her hair showed the same toxins that are found in rat poison. This means that Britney's passing was not natural and was not due to pneumonia or anemia. From what I gather, now Angelo himself did just recently pass away of old age, so he's not here to speak for himself anymore. And so I'm going to do the best I can to sum up what I feel like he was trying to say. But I do apologize if I get anything wrong. This is just my interpretation. He believed that the United States government, along with Sharon, his ex-wife, Brittany's mother, had something to do with her passing. Now again, if you're on this channel, you know that Hollywood and DC are basically the same thing. Hollywood is DC West. Most of our top-notch celebrities ain't nothing but, you know, the three-letter agencies people. We know that Hollywood is used as a mouthpiece for what these nefarious groups want to say to us. It's all tied up together. If you're on this channel, you already know that. And basically from what I understand, what Angela was saying is he was kind of saying the same thing, that this was a very strategic move for a very strategic purpose. Now this also is backed by a woman named Julie Davis. Now, Julie Davis was born in the USSR. She immigrated over to the United States to work as a stunt double in Hollywood. And she still is registered with the Academy of Motion Pictures of Arts and Sciences. She ended up marrying a man named BJ Davis, who is a film producer. Now, after the events of September of 2001, y'all know what I'm saying, Julie, like many other Americans, decided that they wanted to serve their country. They wanted to do something for the greater good. And so she started to work for Homeland Security. She started working in customs. And one of the biggest ports in the south of the United States was where she was posted. Now, on July 4th of 2004, roughly five years before Brittany passed away, 
she was notified by her higher ups to be on the lookout for a group of people that were allegedly tied to the same people that were blamed for the events of 2001 to be crossing through this border. On the day that this happened, Julie Davis reported that 23 people came through that met this description of who they were looking for. She immediately went to her higher ups to turn these people in. When they didn't do anything about it, she went above them to turn these people in. And this is when all hell broke loose for Julie Davis. Before this happened, Julie Davis was a model employee. She had no records or warnings or write-ups. She was outstanding at her job. She had even won many awards for her job as a Border and Customs agent. But once she went above her higher-ups to turn in these 23 people that could have come through to hurt citizens, she then had everything turned upside down on her. She went through about 54 investigations by Homeland Security. They were setting Julie Davis up. Her home one day was raided by 27 Department of Homeland Security agents, literally her colleagues, where she was arrested and she herself was labeled as a domestic. During her investigation, Department of Homeland Security assigned a new supervisor to Julie Davis's unit. This was a woman named Susan Boutwell. Now, Susan Boutwell was not experienced enough for this position. She had before this a lower ranking than Julie Davis. But Susan Boutwell was replacing a man who held that position first who supported Julie Davis. Basically, he was calling a spade a spade. He knew what the United States government was doing to Julie Davis and he was supporting her. So they had to put somebody else in his shoes and they removed him from his position. Susan Batwell, under oath, told a pretty wild story. She claimed that her daughter was an up-and-coming actress in Los Angeles and had met Brittany Murphy on an audition. She claimed that Brittany Murphy told her or her daughter, I'm not really sure which one, that on July 4th of 2004, Julie Davis and her husband, BJ Davis, were on location filming a movie and weren't even at the Customs and Border Patrol. And so everything that Julie Davis was alleging happened with these 23 people who crossed the border can't be true because Julie Davis wasn't even there. Now again, Susan Batwell testified this under oath. Well, when Brittany Murphy found out about this whole story that Susan Boutwell told, she piped up and said no, that that's not true, that she doesn't even know who Julie Davis was. But then she would go on to befriend Julie Davis because she was now going to witness in her favor. This means that Susan Batwell committed perjury in order to protect Department of Homeland Security. Unfortunately, before Brittany Murphy was due to testify in Julie Davis's trial, you guessed it, she passed away. Now, of course, since Brittany Murphy is no longer with us, the narrative has shifted that Julie Davis just like imagined this friendship with Brittany Murphy and all that they had was like a fan letter she had written her at one point. Pretty handy seeing that Brittany Murphy is no longer around to tell us her story. Now, again, I am highly suspicious of Sharon. In Sharon and Angelo's relationship, it's most people probably are looking at Angelo for being like the bad guy. And maybe he was tied up into some organized groups, if you know what I mean. But it seems like Sharon was actually the nefarious one. It seems quite weird that she was basically the sole person with her daughter all those years. She was the one pushing her into show business right before she entered high school and was basically there with her the whole way. Again, 
parents do support their children, and we do have this idea of helicopter parents, but this kind of crossed a line, in my opinion. We do have Britney living in the same house as Britney Spears, both complaining of the same dark entities that were within the house. We now know, again, of the tunnel systems and the idea of mind control used on some of these young starlets, especially young women. And then you've got the whole thing tied up with Julie Davis with the United States government and Brittany Murphy trying to defend her. It's like the perfect storm. Now it's been over 10 years since Brittany Murphy passed away. And I do hope that her spirit and her soul are at peace. Will we ever find out the truth behind Brittany Murphy's passing? I think we will. I don't think she's the only one that's had a strange and mysterious passing over from Hollywood. I would not be surprised if we find out more nefarious information about Sharon, but again, that's just my opinion, my alleged opinion, and hopefully soon her passing can receive some justice. Now, we will be returning back to our series on New Orleans. Of course, on Wednesday, we will be doing part four on the apocalypse of Abraham. I am deep in the study of Marie Laveau. That was by far one of the most requested people y'all wanted me to research for this series. And it's very, very interesting, guys. I mean, shocker. I, I don't know if you guys are going to like what I have to say about Marie Laveau from what I found, but I don't think you will be surprised. Let's just say that the Catholic Church has inverted a lot of shit. And Marie Laveau not, might not actually be the bad guy in this whole story. She might have just been painted as such by the real bad guys in New Orleans, which had to do with, again, now, just a quick question for you guys. Um, in studying New Orleans, I found a lot of like fun foods, and I'm not really a foodie, but it kind of looks a little fun, and some of these restaurants have some fun stories attached to them down in New Orleans with the Cajun and the Creole and the difference between the two. And so I was thinking for like a bonus episode, if that's something you guys wanted to do, not necessarily like a deep dive into like the dark underworld of our our elite, but just like a fun video um, to try to make some of these dishes that are made in New Orleans, kind of tell you the backstory of how they came to be historically, and then try to make them for you guys. Because especially for people who are not from the United States, maybe you're not super familiar with some of these Creole or Cajun foods, but it might, so it might be kind of fun for us to explore that like on bonus episodes or something on the weekend. So just let me know if that's something you'd be interested in. Again, if these comments are not eight or if these comments are disabled for this video, which again, I'll know in the edit editing process, then I will put a section up on the community board for you to let me know what you think happened to Brittany Murphy and to also let me know if you want us to do some bonus episodes with some Creole and Cajun dishes. All right, guys, thank you so much for sitting through that. And thank you to Josh McKay for doing our opening music. If you would like to purchase the whole complete song, there's a link down in the description box below. Thank you to Todd Roderick for helping me get this video out to you all today. I hope you are having a fantastic Monday. Hold the line. The best is yet to come. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.